the change management for Japanese manufacturing companies in India. The presentation is uh, given by Mr. Tomoi Isogai-san. He is a freelance advisor in Indo-Japanese relations, former managing director to Sharp India Limited, director Kansai Japan India Culture Society in Kobe, Japan. I would like to request Mr. Tomo, uh, Tomoi Isogai-san to share your presentation and share your thoughts about it. Okay, thank you, Dana-chan, and uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'd like to talk uh, just uh, briefly about India-Japanese relations post-COVID-19, which uh, we all hope that will come sooner. And uh, just let me uh, share my screen first of all. Okay, within the limited time, I'd like to speak my own perspective. So this is my uh, personal view. I just put the title uh, change management, but uh, this was requested by uh, IJBC. My uh, true title uh, is Indo-Japanese relations post COVID-19. So let me just go through. Number one, what is change management? Number two, beyond industry 4.0. Number three, India, Japan's strongest partners. Number four, becoming world-class. Number five, ideal Indo-Japanese relationship. Okay, so let me just go. First, what is the change management, so to speak? Yeah, many people say, oh, talk about this topic. I just took from the internet, one good definition about it by ASQ. Change management is defined as the methods and manners in which a company describes and implements changes with, within both its internal and external processes. This includes preparing, supporting employees, establishing the necessary steps for the change and monitoring pre and post change activities to ensure successful implementation. So it takes a lot of processes and actually changes. Significant organizational change can be challenging. It often, often requires many levels of cooperation and many involve different independent entities within an organization. Yes, that's very true. Developing a structured approach to change is critical to help ensure a beneficial transition while mitigating disruption. So I think this is a great uh, uh, definition of change management. And I've been through this kind of uh, activities by myself when I was in the corporate world. So I really understand change is sometimes very, very uh, challenging and tiresome uh, processes because people just, you know, feeling comfortable doing the same thing as before. Any change can require a lot of energy to divert, you know, things or change the direction of where you're going. So it, it needs a really big effort and energy. Now, the COVID-19 has changed the workplace management in many ways. And the, here is one article I got. I got it, uh, I found it in uh, World Economic Forum. And in this small article, as an introductory part, you know, there are many new words appearing in this small, you know, context, or I mean texts, see? There are six new words, new normal, new technologies, new roles, new skills, new mindsets, and new quickly changing workplace. So I think there are many new things are happening because of this COVID-19 to us all. And I'm particularly myself, I'm feeling that very strongly because I never thought about, uh, you know, to talking to the people worldwide through online, but I did it more than, 100 times already. 
since the COVID-19 started. So in this World Economic Forum, it says five ways COVID-19 has changed the workplace. So there are uh, five things that you may want to know. Number one, rapid reskilling and upskilling skilling is required. Quick adoption of new advanced technology is a must. Number two, changing leadership and management competencies. This is very important. Corporate culture and leadership skills focus on empathy. Empathy is one word, very important word after the pandemic. Number three, a culture of trust, transparency and openness are important, all to be supportive of one another. So teamwork is getting more important than ever. Number four, individual and social well-being is sought after. Yes, mental, social, physical, and financial well-being is very, very important. Number five, working in a more agile way is also an important key factor for success. Simpler, faster, and less expensive ways to operate is sought after as well, right? Okay, so this is just to uh, one uh, reference from the World Economic Forum, and it you know describes uh, the situation in the corporate world and any uh, working environment has uh, you know faced those changes equally, right? Now, let me just talk about a little bit about the future of our society. Uh, industry 4.0 is now going on. As you may know, Industry 4.0 refers to the combination of several major technology innovations, all maturing at the same time, that is expected to significantly shift the landscape of manufacturing industry. So these technologies like advanced robotics, artificial intelligence, sophisticated sensors, cloud computing, and big data analytics all exist in manufacturing sector today in some form, but as they integrate with one another, the physical and virtual works uh, worlds will interlink and transform the industry. So this is the uh, evolution of industry 4.0 from 1.0 to uh, 4.0 now we are living. The next is industry 5.0 maybe, as the European Union say, human-centric, sustainable, and religion. religion. Yes, that may be so. Industry 5.0 is characterized by going beyond producing goods and services for profit. It shifts the focus from the shareholder value to stakeholder value and reinforces the role and the contribution of industry to society. So it places the well-being of the worker at the center of the production process and uses new technologies to provide prosperity beyond jobs and growth while respecting the production limits of the planet. Yeah, so it, it complements the existing Industry 4.0 approach by specifically putting research and innovation at the service of transition to a sustainable, human-centric, and resilient European industry. So this is the European point of view, but I like to tell you what Japan is looking at. Japan is looking at society 5.0, okay? The history of mankind reveals that the evolution of human society has been fueled by technological advances with the key steps along the way, just such as the society 1.0, hunter-gatherer society, Agrarian society number two, uh, society 3.0 as industri industrial society, and we do live in an information society, which is society 4.0. And the next will come society 5.0, as the Japanese government uh, uh, proposes, a human-centered society that balances economic advancement with the resolution of social, social problems by a system that highly integrates cyberspace and physical space. 
So this is a visual image of society 5.0 in, in the uh, center circle. The, all the, the rest of the four corners are showing the current society 4.0. Society 5.0 achieves a high degree of convergence between cyberspace or virtual space and physical space or real space. Huge amount of information collected from sensors in physical space is accumulated and in cyberspace. In the cyberspace, this big data is being analyzed by artificial intelligence and those results are fed back to humans in physical space in various forms. So things and systems are all connected in cyberspace and optimal results obtained by AI, which is exceeding, exceeding the capabilities of humans are being fed back to physical space. So this is the image of 4.0 and this is the image of five, society 5.0. So the upper space is cyberspace, the uh, below space is uh, physical space. Okay, and Society 5.0 would also contribute to meeting the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs established by the United Nations. The Japan aims to become the first country in the whole world to achieve a human-centered society, which is Society 5.0, in which anyone can enjoy a high quality of life, full of vigor. It intends to accomplish this by incorporating advanced technologies in diverse industries and social activities and fostering innovation to create new values. So creating new values is the goal. Some of the examples are already shown and introduced here in the government website in Japan. So this is the image, comfort, vitality, and high quality lives is you know, surrounded with the Society 5.0. Okay, India and Japan. Let's talk about India Japan relationship. It has become this special strategic and global partnership, as you may know. It's not a bilateral relations anymore, it's a global partnership. And Japan India Vision 2025 20, uh, has been agreed upon by the uh, both uh, nations especially in the field of IoT and AI solutions. So this will bring about a convergence between India's flagship programs, such as Digital India, Startup India, and Smart City, with Japan's Society 5.0 to promote societal benefits. And uh, one concrete uh, memorandum has been signed off by the two nations two ministers, and this agreement reached in the field of information and commun communication technologies, ICT, by both the countries on the developments of 5G technologies, telecom security, submarine optical uh, fiber cable system, spectrum management, smart cities, high altitude platform for broadband, disaster management, and public safety, etc. And Japan Industrial Township has been established in 12 cities, right? And there will be 13 in the near future. And very important point here, the Quad, the new allies, right? The new uh, Quad allies uh, means USA, Australia, India, and Japan has been formulated since some years ago, but this has been very much uh, getting the importance. Now, becoming world class is the target for both India and Japan, because we just keep our strengths and competitiveness in the whole industries. So particularly, particularly in the manufacturing sector, I like to recommend one book authored by an Indian researcher, ex-professor uh, at JNU. Uh, Dr. Prem Motwani has uh, published this book, and he was talking about this book yesterday, uh, his sessions. So this book expounds the Japanese manufacturing management model, which enjoyed tremendous popularity in India 
but has not yet been adopted in its entirety for various social uh, and economical or cultural reasons. So he's talking about those issues and he's proposing what India should do and to see what Japan has done in the past. There are many lessons to learn from, okay? Now, let me talk to you about Indo-Japan relationship even a little bit more. We have to establish a win-win relationship. Yes, what is win-win? In my perspective, win-win means co-work to win. We have to collaborate and not to compete, but to cooperate each other. One more factor is mutual growth. The mutual growth is very, very important. How? To help each other to grow together. That is a point. Okay. Work together for, uh, with the mutual trust and respect. That is very basic factor for success. So when the new Japanese investors are coming and Indians are welcoming them and let's work together, forming a joint venture or whatever it is, the true ideal Indo-Japan relationship, as I think, is such that no more seller or buyer. You are not seller or buyer, right? We are the seller, you are the buyer is a very, you know, traditional relationship. Let's forget about that. No more discounts or rebates. Talking about rebates and discounts all the time in discussion. Let's stop it. We need to discuss more on incentives and bonuses that should be won by the hardworking, right? And no more principal or distributor. Who is a principal? Who is a distributor? Who is the boss? Let's not talk about that. Let's be a good relationship and no more, no problems. I like to ask all the Indian people, don't to say, not to say no problem when you are being asked by any Japanese people. What about this and that? See, no problem sounds like a very positive, but if it is followed by excuses and sorry, then that will not make sense. So in short, my ideal Japan, Indo-Japan relationship will be like this strategic, sustainable business partner to be. And we can do that through co-development, through learning and with respect, mutual respect, okay? So this is what we need to do. And this is the mindset I think both Indians and Japanese should maintain. That is the new relationship. Okay, so when it comes to a team, if you have a team like joint venture team, some of the important factors or elements to make a strong team and successful team, there are four things that I want to mention here. T for transparency, See, especially in, in terms of joint venture you know, or endeavors, this transparency is a very key word for success. You can't just keep any secret right behind. Number two is the empowerment. Yeah, you cannot control everybody. So you need to know who to depend, who to empower people and to make a success in all teams, right? Number three, A, for appreciation and acknowledgement. Yes, whenever you see Either part of the families, I mean the joint venture families, Indian part or Japanese part, whoever done a great job or like a smaller team, you must appreciate them and acknowledge them in front of everyone. Number four, the last but not the least, motivation. It's very, very important factor to make a strong team because without a motivation, Nobody will work harder. Everyone can work harder for themselves. But for somebody else, for the company, 
yes, motivation is so important factor. Now, I think we are living, all we are living in a, vola, a, a VUCA world, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. After the pandemic, we are truly living in this world, VUCA world. Again, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. So those are the four very new concepts in the environment where we are living. In this VUCA world, some people said, this is just I found in the internet, some people said this, we have to have a clear vision. We have to have a deep understanding. We need to have a clarity in what we are doing. And we need to keep the agility in what we're doing. So from the very fragile world, VUCA world, we just have to be agile ourselves to succeed and survive in this book of work. That is somebody has shown in the internet. Now, my version is here. My version is a little bit different. We have to have a clear vision. Yes, I agree. We have to have a deeper understanding. Yes, I agree. But instead of clarity, Instead of clarity, I put courage. You know, you have to have a courage to make a change. If we are talking about change management, this is a very important factor because you don't know if your change can make a success or not. It's a big challenge. You may not be very sure that this change will make a good, great success. So you need a courage to decide, determine what you're doing, going to do some changes. So courage is a very important factor, I think. And last, agility. Instead of agility, I put adaptability. Now it's getting more and more important and necessary. After the pandemic, as you have already experienced, yes. Adaptability to the changes of the world, to the changes of the environment is what is all needed. So in my opinion, to survive in the VUCA world, we need to have a clear vision, deeper understanding, and courage to change the things or enter into the new uh, uh, endeavor and adaptability to suit yourself into a new environment. So this is what I really want to stress at the, at the last moment. When we are talking about change the world, change management, and we are talking about Indo-Japan relationship, yes, we are very, very strong you know, in bonding ourselves. But to make a joint venture, particularly in the field of manufacturing, to make it a very, successful endeavor and to make a world-class industry, there are still a lot to do. Yes, let's work together and make Indian economy number one in the world someday before 2050. Thank you. Let's build a solid partnership for a prosperous future together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tomio Isogai-san. It was a very informative session, sharing of factful thoughts. I really thank you for uh, sharing us, sharing with us.